Oh, look who it is. What a surprise. As if. I can't believe Where I found you here. here. It's been so long. Can I just say, I'm standing here feeling kind of jealous. Why? Well, look. Oh, and look. we didn't even put it there. It oh, is wasn't that even stained. No? No. Well, I mean, it's selling very well, so why not? And why not? the cover looks good. I think the cover kind of pops. I'm wondering if you get a bit jade. You know, I've had it one or two times, books in windows, but you must get it all the time. So when I, the, the thing that gives, makes my socks go up and down is not seeing the book in the bookstore window, but it's walking down the aisle of an airplane and seeing people yes. read the book. That, when you see people it's, reading it. I've sat next the, to somebody once who was reading my book and I didn't say anything. I was far too So I had exactly that experience. After Liar's Poker came out, I, I was, I, it was a version of this. I sat down to reread my book because I was coming back for the paperback book tour from England. And the guy next to me goes, he looks at the book and he says, I've read that book. And I said, all right, before I could stop him, he says, cynical bastard. <laughs> we spent, it was a seven hour flight, seven hours. And he was playing 20 questions, trying to figure out who I was. And he was getting closer and closer and closer. <laughs> and I was just, it was a so Did you manage to make the whole flight by the time you landed and oh, you figured it out? He hadn't figured it out. That you were the cynical bastard. Yeah, I was the cynical bastard. Should yeah. we go on in? Yeah, yeah. This is, do you know this shop, by the way? I, Have you know, ever I, been yeah, here? Yes, but ages ago. Uh, I, I mean, I used to live in Washington. So. I know. I, this is my favorite bookshop in DC. Well, I can see why. So, this is interesting because your books were all over the store. <laughs> There we go, just to make sure that people don't miss that one. This is the author's instinct, isn't it? It is. It's it's a, make actually, sure you know what it is? It's sort of like, it's put in the it's right like position. It, put it over someone else's. Yeah, I've done yeah, that too. <laughs> I shouldn't do that. Anyway, we um, No, I think, that, I think that it shows up enough. Um, you write about such an eclectic group of subjects, but you write about them in a similar way. Is if that you're, fair? If your point of entry is character, and it doesn't matter where the character is, you can go, you go anywhere. I mean, if you think about, like, this is my first book here? This one. All right. That taught me a lesson, and the lesson was... Liar's Poker. Taught Liar's Poker lesson. taught me a lesson, and the lesson was, if you can attach the reader to a person, they'll follow that person anywhere. And I know I, I, know I need to explain, like, more, the mortgage bond market. Who wanted to read about the mortgage bond market? But once you were attached to me, they would follow me into the mortgage bond market. And so all these books are just using, is the same device. So when you say I write about it in the same way, I think that's true. It sort of like tends to be character first. And the character leads you through material, teaches you, gives you insights, all the rest. But uh, a lot of authors write about character, but you also, on top of that, I'd say the kind of thing you're known for is choosing these subjects that are quite dense, quite nerdy, don't f sound on paper. If I was giving, getting the elevator pitch, right. I wouldn't think, oh yeah, that's a blockbuster subject that everybody's going to want to read about. No, this is funny. You and then you turn them into yeah. movies that Brad Pitt wants to be in. So it's funny you say that because I have found, almost, it's almost a reliable indicator that I've found my next subject. If I'm at a dinner party and someone says, what are you working on? And I say it and their eyes glaze over <laughs> and there's no follow-up question. And, and it's like, uh, you know, you can see them thinking, God, I feel so sorry for this bastard. He's got to go write this book about that. And, and. What has happened is I've gotten particularly interested in something and seen something that's interesting about it that isn't obvious to the world in some way. And so it actually is, it, it, that, that ends up being a good thing in the end. It's sort of like, it's a little bump. Do you really want to read about high frequency trading or do you really want to read about the United States government? Right. Right. And there's a first initial bump, but when, when someone says, actually you do because, People light up. So like, now I have a reason to go learn something new. But so, so what comes first? Is it uh, the tradings of Wall Street and people don't know what they're doing, so the, the big short? Is it, is it the subject, the inner workings of the American oh, government, see. the pandemic planning, the back office of a baseball team and the number crunches? Or is it the characters that you're looking for? I, mean, I can't do it without a character. So that's a necessary ingredient. Sometimes the idea has preceded the character, like the big short. I, what I knew, I knew, I knew the Wall Street firms had made these c catastrophic bets on subprime mortgages, right? I knew that they, they were the stupid money at the table and that was a new thing. And that there was smart money at the table. And the question was who? So in that case, it was, well, they were, it turned out there were 15 money managers who kind of gone all in on this bet. And I did a casting search. I mean, I went looking for characters to tell the story about what had happened. 
So I didn't meet the characters until after I had the notion. Moneyball is sort of like all at once that I was asking, I was just curious, like how is this baseball team winning games when it doesn't have any money? And when I met Billy Bean and he started to explain it to me, it was both him and the idea happening at once. Sometimes it's like, I mean, going in for the new one, it just starts with like with the, character. the character and a situation, like totally socially maladjusted human being who most in most of human history, the world would have found no particular use for, goes from being worth nothing to being worth $22.5 billion in 18 months, and then starts to change the world in all kinds of weird ways. Um, Michael, let's talk about your book, the new one, the one that you were just saying to me has caused all of this noise. So you, you spent a lot of time with Sam Bankman-Fried before you started even writing the book. Mm. And I was wondering whether the, you, you write about this guy who's brilliant, creates this crypto exchange. It's quite a dense subject. He is very nerdy. Did, and you spend a lot of time interviewing him and then it all sort of spectacularly gets derailed. And I was wondering, did your narrative process, to the extent that while you were interviewing him, you had a kind of plan for what you were going to write, did that get derailed too by what happened to Sam? We got railed more than derailed. <laughs> but you really, because I, I had, I, I, I went in, I go in, usually these things kind of groping. I found some character who I find interesting and he's in some weird situation. And so you had this person who, child of academics, clearly kind of socially troubled, like he has trouble with other people, um, has become one of these instant billionaires. And not just a billionaire, like Forbes had him at $22.5 billion, and it took him 18 months to get it. And then he was going to give it all away to save humanity. So there was this odd backdrop. That led me in. And it was just like, what is the story here? And I spent... Well, I met him in the fall, October-ish of 2021, and I started to really immerse myself in the Bahamas at FTX in January, February of the next year. So all the way through November, when it collapses, I, didn't, I hadn't written a word. I would played with ideas about how the book might go. When we got to November and it collapsed, I didn't have, until it collapsed, I didn't know how the book ended. I didn't know where it was going. And I had, I had agonizing conversations with friends and with myself about whether I was even going to do it because I just didn't know it was going to work as a book. And my view of him, I'd always, I mean, one of the things that interested me was the way his mind worked. He thrived, he thought, and maybe it's true, in these semi-chaotic environments. And he, so he created them over and over. And you could see that this business, before it all fell apart, was like, this isn't normal. There's no organization chart. There's no list of employees. Nobody has a title that bears any relationship to what they actually do. People don't know who they report to or who reports to them. It's just like total chaos. That it isn't that surprising that something went wrong, but I would never have guessed what we're, you know, I did that, that's the caliber. So what happened surprised me because it's so stupid. Uh, it, it made, it didn't, doesn't, if you understand the businesses, it doesn't make a great deal of sense what he did. He, he torpedoed a company that was worth $40 billion that he had owned more than half of for the benefit of this hedge fund that was maybe worth nothing or not worth much and that he should have just gotten rid of long ago. That, that was the oddness of it that I had to sort of adapt to. There's a great scene at the end of the book and let's fast forward and talk a little bit about your relationship with Sam because as you say, there's been quite a lot of noise about it. But there's a scene at we the end- We didn't sleep together. I know you didn't sleep together. <laughs> And that is not what the noise has been about. <laughs> Just to be clear, oh, okay. this, is, this I... is a family-friendly program. <laughs> um, there, a, but it is interesting. I mean, I find this sometimes as a journalist. You know, how do you, how close do you get to somebody? How much does natural human empathy kick in against my reporter's instincts? Right. And would, I'm sure you have that. You must would, have had that. So I've had that problem with other subjects, um, because I know how sensitive and easily wounded they might be. He was unbelievably easy in this regard because he himself by his own admission lacks a lot of human feeling i knew he didn't feel anything about me like he didn't care about me mm. he never asked me a single question about myself he never asked me what i was doing um he didn't you know he never asked me like what was it like to write moneyball not nothing nothing no question like that no interest whatsoever in me and i sensed it 
So it was pretty easy for me not to have that much interest in his feelings or That's him. That's interesting. Do you ever have that with your characters? No, I've had Do you ever feel they've got close to you or into your heart or into your brain and therefore it's hard to be objective about them? Um, the answer to that is yes. It's, it, that, that it's almost always uh, you develop a lot of feeling because there is feeling in the air after a while. For the most part, it doesn't, those feelings don't, I think, affect how I write. But there are times when I know I have those feelings and I have to just make sure that they're not going to bother me when I write. But this wasn't one of them. Do you have like, do you have like uh, tricks sounds glib, but do you have uh, strategies that you fall back on to get people to open up? Yes. You do things with them. You don't just talk to them. You don't just have an interview. You play paddle tennis or you go on a trip or you accompany them to their meetings. Uh, so I'm approaching this all wrong. Well, we walk down the street and we went to the bookstore together and we've spent time together before. So it's, we're past that point. When, once, but the, the breaking the ice thing, single best job interview I ever got, I ever had, was, a, was for um, leading a tour, a very fancy tour group that sent kid, um, rich American kids on fancy trips through Europe. And they hired recent college graduates to lead them. I went to New York City. I, this, I, so I used this in my, my, in my writing life to interview with the head of the tour company. His name was Robbie Brown. And I get there and he goes, oh my God. I forgot you were coming for an interview. I'm so sorry. We're moving the furniture from, from this office down to this office. Ah, I'll talk to you another time. Could you just help me move the furniture? So we moved desks, we moved cabinets, all the rest. And then he says, I'll, I'll call you in for the interview when I need to. Instead, he called and said, you got the job. Flash forward three months. I'm in a bed in like Belgium with my fellow leader in this fancy tour operation. And I said, you know, I just occurred to me, I never really had a job interview. I just moved this guy's furniture from one side of the office to the other. And my fellow leader said, I did that too. I went in and he said, sorry, I, I did, forgot we had. And what he was doing, it's so smart. Yeah. You learn so much yeah. about people when you cooperate with are them. Are they a team player? Are they a team player? Have mm. they thoughts about doing things? Mm. Will they voice those thoughts? Mm. How do they interact? Are they with generous? You? All that. A million right. things that you learn playing, doing things with them, playing games with them. So I do do that. Uh, that's one trick. Mm. Other trick is force myself to look, look at the places where the, the character is least self-conscious. Like, your toenails. You know, it's not, it's not your face. It's like, that, you look at your face and you want your face to certain look. You're, you're thinking that's what people are looking at, right? And so that, that's going to be very self-conscious. It's where you are, I think nobody's looking, where it gets really interesting. And I, so I try to look where nobody's looking. I try to be where nobody is. Before you became a writer, you studied art history, mm. and then you worked as a cabinet maker for a bit. I worked at Wildenstein, the art dealership, first six months. Right. The famous moving new... paintings around. I was a stock boy for Wildenstein, but I mean, the minute I got to hold, it was a fabulous job. I got to hold all the art, know all what they owned. They owned billions and billions of dollars of art, and I got to have that interaction with the stuff. Then I worked as a three months apprentice as a woodworker in New Jersey. Uh, with a master cabinet maker. Then I went and led teenage girls through Europe uh, on these fancy trips. And then I ended up at the London School of Economics and did a master's in economics for two years. But from, cab from art history to cabinet making to London School of Economics to do a master's in economics, it's not an obvious There's no, no, I was groping. I, I, you were looking. I, was looking. I knew when I graduated that I, at every stop I was writing. I knew I wanted to write but I didn't know how it was going to happen. You, you had a plan to go to Wall Street and make a ton of money um, and then become a writer, very sensibly, by the way. Mm -hmm. Everyone should make money before they start the, trying to write Right, books. that's right. Yeah. And, you, and then you sort of ditched I, the plan. I ditched the plan. Two things happened. One was the attention my writing was getting was going through the roof. I was writing under my, I had to write under my mother's maiden name mainly because I was getting in trouble with the Wall Street firm because I was writing about Wall Street kind of stuff. Um, but that I could see, oh my goodness, like people will read, people want what, I, what I'm writing. That helped. Uh, but the big thing that happened was, what was I? 26, been there two years. I looked up ahead of me in the firm and these ancient 35 year olds, I thought, would that person ever leave now to, be, to do anything? 
And by the time you were 35, you were so yoked to the place and the money. You, you had a, li a whole life built around being in this place. I knew that if I hung around that long, I'd just never leave. And so I, it scared me. So I just went, I pushed away. I just said, I've got to just take that risk. Uh, and you called your dad up. Oh, I did. And he said. He thought I was insane. Yeah. No, no. They just handed me. I mean, I mean, he was a very prominent lawyer, ran a law firm in New Orleans, and they just paid me as much as he got paid. And, and he was like, what on earth? I know you don't know anything. I know you don't know anything about money. What, you, you just got paid a quarter of a million dollars? And I said, this is just the ante. They said next year is twice as much. And he goes, you cannot leave. You cannot leave. And, and, and um, my dad gives great advice. He's, he was, I usually, I, I wasn't like most children. I usually listened to my dad. Twice in my life I didn't. And uh, that was the second time. And uh, he was um, wrong. Uh, it was, I mean, I could have gone a whole different direction, but the book that came out of that, Liar's Poker, just set me up, right? I mean, I didn't have to worry about money. I didn't have to worry about what I was going to do with my life. And it's been... Like, I hope he said I was wrong. I hope he one day said that. Yeah, I think he, no, I think he actually refuses to acknowledge now. That he, <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. no, he's forgotten his investment advice. Is That happens all the time. I <laughs> never would have said that. Are there ever um, bits of a story that you find hard to write about? You don't write about romance very much. You don't write about... Well, there I mean, you don't... I, there is. I mean, sex. Relationships generally. Yeah. Intimate relationships. I think... Uh, the relationship between Michael Orr and the Tuies in The Blind Side, very interesting intimate relationship, and continues to be. Um, so I've written, about, and I've written about being a father. Uh, I've written a book about fatherhood. I've written a book about m when it's my relationship. I've done a lot of that, right? I've done I, I did a little book about a relationship I have with a high school coach. Uh, so I don't, I don't have any trouble and I'm not off, put off by it. Right. Do I want to write a, I don't know, do I want to write a conventional love story? I'm not disinterested in relationships. Uh, but I, uh, maybe you're onto something. I don't know. I don't know about this one. Next I, one. I know about that theory. You mentioned fatherhood. Mm -hmm. I want to ask about Dixie. All right. May I? Yep. And you've said that you want to honor her legacy. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? I have a peculiar way of dealing with the death of my child. Um, and it's grown out of, it's grown out of a feeling that is from right from the beginning, that there was a pretty serious gap between what people expected me to feel and how I felt. And um, I mean, the most the, the, the most obvious example was I had lots of letters from people who had lost children, who proceeded to tell me that I would be living with these feelings of guilt. And I thought, that's strange, because I just don't even feel that. I feel incredible sadness. I feel loss. I feel, and the loss I'm feeling is I'm realizing is a loss of love. Uh, but I don't feel guilt. Like, I was a great dad. She had a great life. I, we loved each other. Uh, there was, I didn't, you know, in, in, to use the sports metaphor, which she would love to use, we left it all on the field, right? So it wasn't like, okay, we lost. But it's not that we didn't try. Um... So I didn't feel the things that were coming at me. And then the books that were written about it, and I'd look at it and I'd say, that's, that's not my experience. And I finally concluded that I'm going to, I think I have to approach this in a funny way, the way I approach literary subjects. It's sort of like, it's my vision I'm trying to purify. It's my particular, that everybody has an unusual circumstance, a unique circumstance, that, you, that, that how you feel and how you're going to go through this is, how you, it's partly how you're wired. It's partly what your relationship with was the person you lost. It's partly how they died. Uh, it, 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 it's dependent on a lot of different things. So this is going to be an individual sport, me figuring out how to, how to live with the grief. You've spoken about gratitude, which, you know, it sounds like a, such a hard place to get to when you've lost a child. How do you, how do you get to gratitude? The intensity of the pain I felt and still feel is in direct, direct proportion to the power of the love I felt. And I didn't just love my child or my, all three of my children. I feel the same way. I liked my child. I just, it was just, it was a, it was a friendship and a parenting relationship at the same time. And, um, I'm incredibly grateful 
that I felt that I felt that way. Like the grief is so pure, like the sadness, it's not, they're none of these toxic emotions. There's not anger, there's not guilt, there's not res- whatever it is, the regret, those kind of things that kind of eat at you. Sadness doesn't eat at you. Sadness, sadness and you know, tears and laughter go together. You're in a different emotional space when you're in tears and laughter than you are with anger and resentment and guilt. And the, I'm grateful that the relationship was such that she's left me with tears and laughter. Uh, so I don't have that much trouble getting to that spot. There's a meta thing going on too, though. And it's, I really do think... So you talk about how you get to know people and you look at their toenails as opposed to how they do their makeup. Uh, Listen very carefully to the way people tell their stories and you will learn a lot about them. You'll notice patterns. There's always someone who's getting shafted or there's always someone who something lucky happened to them or there's always someone who's uh, being offended by people or that the patterns in the way people, people think that their story is just an objective story. But in fact, what they're doing is imposing their kind of, their, their makeup, their psychology on the world and generating the same story over and over. My children all say, they all say I'm the luckiest person they've ever known. And one of the things they say is that like, whenever we go to a restaurant, there's always a parking spot for you right outside the restaurant. And I say, you know why that is? And they go, why? I says, because I look for the parking spot. I assume it's gonna be there. Most people think the spot right outside the restaurant is gonna be taken, but I think it's gonna be there. And uh, it isn't always there, but they think it's there an unusual amount of time for me. And it's just that I'm always looking for it because I think I'm gonna get it. And it's, I think that if you, that narrative is important and I've kind of insisted on forcing the narrative with Dixie's death and Dixie. It's another way of honoring her. She doesn't need me to curl up in a little ball and never do anything again. She needs me to be big and brave and honor her. Here's to Dixie. Oh. Thank you. Yeah.